Shalom, shalom, everyone. This is Teddy Wilson with Seekers of Yahweh Ministries, and welcome <clears throat> to Shavuot 2022. Uh, we want to welcome all of you. Uh, they're going to be joining us live or in the recorded version this evening. We are going to be recording the third part to our Melchizedek Future Temple series. Um, those of you that have been following along, you know yesterday uh, for the Sabbath, we went into part two to kind of bring everybody up to par, but usually not everybody is present. So we're going to have a prelude as we get into the new PowerPoint. Uh, just a few things to recap to make sure that everybody who is viewing does understand uh, what we have going on. Uh, so everybody get your uh, your scriptures. Uh a pen, a piece of paper, there's going to be a lot of information in this. And let me go ahead and get our uh, email address put up there. Everybody's getting ready. <clears throat> so if at any time... Can everybody see that? All right. When we go full view, you should be able to see it pretty well. So uh, if you guys remember last year, this is the way we had to do it so that everybody that's present here uh, during the feast can actually see the PowerPoint at the same time that you are. Um, when I get minimized and the full screen comes in, everybody in the room will be able to see the PowerPoint uh, just like as if you were watching me from home, which is behind us on the wall. So please... Uh, don't mind that thing back there. It's just so that everybody can see my face uh, at the present time. Now, so there's our contact information at the bottom of your screen. Uh, if you would like to contact us about uh, immersion, getting baptized in the proper name of Yahshua, uh, us going out on the road, uh, any type of notification, or if you have any questions concerning our teachings, that's how you can get a hold of me. Hallelujah. Now, so let's go ahead and get prayed in because we have a lot of information and I want to get through this as uh, painlessly as possible. And um, remember, we're talking about things that are so important to the end times. Get your eyes off the blood moons. Get your stay on our planet for a while. Quit chasing Nephilim and flat earth and rocks floating around out there. If one's coming at us, you're not going to stop it. If Yahweh has something spinning out of control in outer space or whatever you believe it is out there, and it's coming directly at us and it's going to make contact with us, you worrying about it or what you believe the shape of the earth is, is not going to stop it from happening. <laughs> Do you understand? What we can change is that upon impact, we know where we're going. This is a very serious topic. It's about the millennial reign, the Melchizedek priesthood, and eternal life in the kingdom with Yahshua, serving him in the future temple prophecy in Ezekiel. And I submit to you this evening, as we clone out, close out part three, you're going to see the connections of everything that we went over last night. Even ancient rabbis were saying that this temple will be built during the what they call revocation or revivication of the dead, meaning there is a resurrection of the dead spoken about in the book of Ezekiel. And there's a resurrection of the dead spoken about in the good news, the Besorah. And those two things don't happen at the same time. And they must be able to be confirmed because the book of Ezekiel prophecy is the same exact prophecy in the book of Revelation. We're going to be presenting that information this evening. The prelude to part four 
is already in part three. Hallelujah. So hold tight because this is going to challenge the very foundation of what we've been taught happens in the end times. Hmm? Blessed be the name of God. Father, we are so thankful for this Moed, this day of Shavuot, um, Pentecost. We thank you so much for all the great food. Hallelujah. And we thank you for all of the great uh, times that we've been sharing together here. We are so thankful. We pray for your blessings, Father, upon your house. And right now, in the mighty name of your redemption, Yahshua, we ask that you would forgive us of any sin that we may have committed against your covenant. And as we come into your presence through your word and the history of this word this evening, we pray that you would open up our hearts and our minds and not only ours, but all of those who are out there that will view this teaching tonight live or in the future. Oh, mighty King, let your will be done this evening. I pray that you would anoint my lips and bring to remembrance everything that you wish for me to speak to your people. For thine is the kingdom, the power, and the glory, the malkuya and the esteem. Hallelujah. Blessed be the name of God. Okay, so... <clears throat> um, throughout this, what you're going to be seeing is the textbook study, just like we did in part one and two. Um, that's going to be the, the format that we use for every one of these so that every time somebody moves from part one to part two, three, and four, that they see the same exact format and things don't get uh, uh, you know made too much different. I want to keep it the same format. So I'm going to get that format uh, pulled up. And then we're going to go ahead and get right into it. Hallelujah. There we go. So there's that. Now. Okay. So, here we are. So, this is what you're going to see. You're just going to hear me narrating, but you're going to see all of my research. And you're going to see all of the cuts and paste. That way, Teddy Wilson cannot fabricate any of this. We're going to bring it even across the board. I'm going to show you what the research that I have done has produced. And may Yahweh be praised through all of it. Hallelujah. All right. So here we go. Future Temple Series and the Malchizedek Priesthood, Part 3, Seekers of Yahweh Ministries out here in Craigmont, Idaho. Hallelujah. So in the points of, the, uh, of study here, we're going to recap key elements from parts one and two. We're going to study more facts about the prior temples. Uh, we're going to look at more quotes from historians, etc., concerning uh, the future temple. And also proof of the Zadokites in Qumran. Now remember, does everybody know where Qumran was? The Qumran community. It's this place outside of Yerushalayim. In the wilderness. Please remember that. It was a place out in the wilderness. Right? And they we have been told uh, by many Jewish scholars that these were Essenes or Essenes, however you've heard that pronounced. Tonight, the information that we've dug up is going to contradict uh, all of these things. And maybe the reason why that, that stuff is being fed to us will also come to fruitation. All right. Now, so we're going to be looking at the proof of the Zadokites in Qumran and the coming future temple. <laughs> oh, Father. We're going to present more evidence about Malchizedek, the uh, Malchizedek's priesthood, uh, its presence in that future temple. And we're going to take a quick look at the uh, uh, coming of part four uh, concerning Ezekiel and the book of Revelation 
and that connection. This is one of the biggest things in part three. This is huge. This is big, and we want to thank and praise Yahweh uh, for what he is showing us. As I know it right now, there's not one ministry out there that's bringing these connections to the prophecies in the Brit, making the connections to the prophecies in uh, specifically the book of Ezekiel. It is an end time prophecy. So recapping part one, future temple differences. This was huge. Rabbi Eliezer, a student from uh, Rashbam, says concerning Ezekiel 45, 25, this is also a change, and it was only included in order to add levels of holiness and purity in the future. The matters here in Ezekiel are relevant only to the present to the prince. That's the Hebrew word nasi, remember, as I have explained. So what he's talking about here is that there's two different priesthoods being taught in the book of Ezekiel, right? And how do we know that um, there are differences is because in his prophecy, there's only X amount of feasts being celebrated. And during those feasts, all of the ways that the sacrifices were brought are totally changed. So that's what we're de dealing with here. Uh, Ezekiel 45 and at verse 25. Uh, Menachem Haran, he, would, he was a teacher at the Hebrew University, notes the many differences in Ezekiel and Numbers. See this? So that's why a lot of these guys, again, wanted to get rid of the book of Ezekiel when they made the canon. Because the book of Ezekiel about the temple, because it wasn't talking about a temple they would build or the one they were operating in. Right. It was talking about a future temple in which the one who was doing the sacrifices would be different. And that the sacrifices for the Moedim or the feasts were all different as well. So it contradicted the pattern in the Torah and they wanted to get rid of it until one rabbi stood up and said, hold on a minute. We get rid of this and we get rid of Israel itself. The resurrection's gone, and most so then all the Pharisees kind of flipped the script on that and changed their mind and said, Yeah, we better hold on to it. Because it does talk about the resurrection of the dead, which is a huge Pharisee plus in their belief. But what we're going to see this evening is that the Sadducees were actually Zadokites. And that means that there was many of them that didn't believe in the resurrection of the dead until. Oh, Father. He was a teacher at the university, uh, the Hebrew University. He notes the many differences in Ezekiel and Numbers, and he argues that the two texts both stem from priestly school, but from different camps within the school. He writes, no direct unmediated connection between the two texts should be imagined. For if there were one, Talking about priesthoods here. If there were one, there is no way to understand why one came and contradicted the previous one in virtually every single detail. Recapping part one as well, Ezekiel chapter 44, verses 13 through 15. Uh, the, this is where Yahweh excludes certain sons of Levi and uh, certain sons of Aaron from altar service. Again, Ezekiel 44, 13 through 25. And so here's what these uh, Hebrew speaking men and these scholars say about that passage. To serve me, meaning they are disqualified from serving me in those capacities that require a Kohen, which is a priest. The only family of the Kohenim the priests that had remained completely uh, loyal and was therefore to be entrusted with the service of the future are called the Kohenim, the Levites. They're in, and they're here. That's in uh, uh, again in 13 through 15 in that chapter, chapter 44. Then it goes on to say the Kohenim of the future are to be the descendants of Zadok. 
What's the Hebrew word for Zadok? The sons of the righteous. Follow me. Hallelujah. The high priest during David's reign, you can read about that in 2 Samuel chapter 8 and verse 17. The unique, the unique status of this family is reflected in the fact that in the book of Chronicles, only the Zadok line of all the Kohanim is traced. And 1 Chronicles, actually that's chapter 24, that's a misprint. You'll find that in uh, 1 Chronicles chapter 24. The line of the descent traces the family of Aaron's son, Eleazar, only through Zadok. Why? The rest of them have turned their backs on Yahweh in temple service and defiled it and caused Israel to go astray. We're talking about corporate judgment. If the priesthood, there's a prophecy that says, as with the, uh, as with the people, so with the priest. They become like one another. So when the priesthood drops the ball, the people know that there's no covering. And yeah, so why are we even, yeah, why are we even worried about it? We're going to get judged. You guys are getting us judged. So the priesthood dropping the ball in the cleansing process of the people causes a complete breakdown in the relationship between Yahweh and his people. Then we're judged corporately. This is taught in the book of Revelation, as we're going to see this evening. Hmm? Recapping part two, Ezekiel chapter 40 and at verse five. When it's talking about, about uh, the passage there where it's talking about outside the temple and surrounding it, listen to what they say. Chapter 45 describes a portion of land to be set aside as a sacred portion for Elohim to the north of the city. In its exact center lies an area of land measuring 500 rods by 500 rods that is to be called the, there we see in Hebrew, Har Habait. Right? They translated that temple mount. Actually, it's the mount of the house where Yahweh dwells. Okay? At six cubits to the rod, this yields an area of nine million square cubits, not feet. Nine million square cubits. Why is that so important? <laughs> okay, cubits. Nine million square cubits. That is very important for us to understand because by contrast, the temple mount of the second temple was only 500 cubits by 500 cubits or 250,000 square cubits. There's no possible way that this thing that's being projected in Ezekiel's prophecy could fit on that thing they're calling the Temple Mount right now. It is downright mathematically impossible, and it's downright impossible that when this thing comes, there's stuff in the way. There's stuff that's going to be leveled. Do you understand that? He's going to cleanse the land by fire in every high place that has exalted itself above the city of Dawid is going to be leveled. And here it comes, the new Jerusalem, the new Hekal, the new temple, the Mishkan HaKodesh. It's going to sit down. It's going to take form and it's going to reside for how long? Forever, eternally. Nine million square cubits, opposed to the biggest thing we've seen this far in civilization as we know it, was only 250,000 square cubits. It's ginormous. It would cover a greater part of that side of the whole city of Jerusalem. Recapping part two, Ezekiel 43, 10 through 11. According to Radok, now remember, these are men of renown. Been teaching the Torah 
with it, from a Hebrew perspective, all their lives. According to Radok, this section goes even further. He explains that the last phrase in verse 11, again, that's Ezekiel chapter 43, verses 10 through 11. He says that the last phrase in verse 11, that they may remember its form and its decrees and perform them as follows. If they do indeed study all the details of the structure and make an effort to remember it, then they will be among those who will build it at the revivication of the dead. You see behind me? That's the English word we call that. Resurrection of the dead. This is huge. As we go into connecting this to the book of Revelation, you're going to see just that. Yahweh is revealing unto us a mystery. He's revealing unto us Hasidot. Huh? The mysteries of the kingdom of Elohim. Things that nobody else knows. That thing that he was breathing to his apostles never stopped. We read the passage this morning during Bible study. He said, and out of the body of Messiah, he was raising up prophets, apostles, evangelists, teachers, leaders, elders. That means that the revelation was not supposed to stop. He's trying to tell us something. He's showing us the design so that we can practice learning about it so that we can partake in helping build it. How special does that? Does anybody feel special in the room tonight? Somebody say hallelujah. 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 At the revivication of the dead, specifically telling us that they believed that this was going to take place after the resur first resurrection of the dead. They thought it was the second, albeit, but Yahshua reveals the first resurrection when he raises Lazarus from the dead. <clears throat> he tells the woman, Isha, did I not tell you that if you believed that you would see the glory of Elohim? That you would see your brother again? She goes, I know I'll see him again in the resurrection. He goes, ah. uh, and he said, roll away the stone. Lazarus, come forth. Showing us, showing them that those who believed in the resurrection of the dead, that he was going to produce, which would be the first resurrection, would come with him into the rain. He's showing us there that there was two separate resurrections. And what we're going to see at the end of this study this evening proves exactly that. We've got to set these things in order. Accordingly, this passage is a guarantee of the resurrection of the dead, that it will take place. Recapping part two, talking about the sons of Zadok. And we're looking in that, uh, looking at that subject in the ancient Hebrew. Look at this. Sons is strong Hebrew number 1121. Bain. It means a uh, uh, it's defined in the Strongs as a son, as a builder of the family name. And in Ephesians chapter 3, it says that by the name of Yahweh, all of the family in heaven and earth is named. So this is how it's coming to pass through the name of Yahweh. I baptize you into the family of Yahweh in the name of, you guys have all heard it invoked over you when I baptize you. The name of Yahshua is his redemption. There it is, right? So that being in that body uh, lines us up to be eligible for the first resurrection with him. Well, Father. And in the ancient Hebrew lexicon, there you see it's bet noon. Um, and it's defined as, uh, one who continues the family line. This is what son is. It's the seed, there you see, bet noon, it's the seed that comes from the house, which was the word in the sense of the relationship between the father and son. The, the word came forth from the father's house, his throne, the Shemayim. Heaven is his Throne, 
and the earth is his footstool. And he came down to the footstool by his spoken word and got in a body and showed us the way back home. Mm. Now, concerning when we're talking about sons of Zadok, Zadok is Strong's Hebrew number 6659. And in the Strong's, it's defined as just. At its root, it means to be or make right in a moral or forensic sense. We're talking about forensics here. Deep investigation. <laughs> the things that reveals the truth of the matter. When a crime has been committed, especially. Huh? Especially when there has been a crime against the law. <laughs> oh, Father. In the ancient Hebrew lexicon, there you see it's Zod, Dalit, uh, uh, Kuf, and it's talking about uh, seed, ones that are going to continue in the family name, right? In Yahshua, the redemption of Israel, it's talking about um, those who are traveling a path leading to a door in time. There's the resurrection of the dead. Right? When a new door is opened in the future that leads us into the kingdom. Hallelujah. Sons of Sadak. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Mm, now, <clears throat> in the ancient Hebrew lexicon, there you see it's defined as concretely, it means straight. Make your crooked paths straight, he said. He's giving you instruction on how to follow him and get in there. Righteous. One who is upright or righteous is one who walks a straight and narrow path. Clearly, we see that sons of Zadok refers to the seed that comes from the house of the righteous. So <clears throat> we have two different groups of people. One resurrection in the body of Yahshua. Those are sons of the righteous, and he is Malki, the king, Zadok, the righteous king, who's bringing his seed that will continue the family line into the kingdom with him. And then the second resurrection of the dead, what this shows us is that only the sons, the descendants of Zadok, who were Levites, but only the sons of Zadok will be coming in to altar service in the temple with us in the future temple. They're the only ones. You can't be just any old son of your own. You can't be just any old Levite. You must be the descendants of Zadok. So clearly we see that sons of Zadok refers to uh, the seed that comes from the house of the righteous on a path to a door in time. Zod Dalit Kuf. Physical descendants of Zadok at their time and the sons of the righteous one, Melchizedek, at their time. And you know what? This also reminds me of another passage that says we shall not be made perfect apart from them in the book of Hebrews. Right? And each, 1 Corinthians chapter 15, and each one in his own time. It's talking about the resurrection of the dead. 1 Corinthians 15. <clears throat> now, uh oh, something happened. So I'm going to remind me to come backwards because those those got put in in the wrong order. We'll have to come back up to them. These are the ones I'm after right now. Yeah. All right. All right, so this is out of the Jerusalem Post. <clears throat> it's referred to in an article that's written by Abraham Rabinovich. Wow. A priestly library is the name of the article. <clears throat> so you can go read the whole article yourself. But this is what I wanted to bring to a head uh, to present to you this evening. 
He's speaking about Professor Rachel Elior. Now, this is a lady who is a historian and archaeologist buff, and she is laced in the Torah. She is a Jewish woman. Very laced in his, she's a professor. She's very well educated. And she was, she was asked to come speak and she spoke. And what she brought contradicted the majority of what we've been taught about Qumran. Now, remember this, they are in the wilderness. Qumran was out in the wilderness Remember that old thing that we heard about that it's very possible that John the Baptist was a member of the Qumran community? Hold up a minute. <laughs> oh, Father. Prof Professor uh, Rachel Elior set scholarly nerves jangling on several continents last month when she not only denied that the Dead, Dead Sea Scrolls were authored by the ascetic Essenes sect, as is widely believed, but suggested that the Essenes never existed. Oh, Professor, do you think she was worried about her job? Or do you suppose that this educated woman was more uh, uh, worried about the preservation of the truth concerning her heritage. Hear the heart of this woman. The Essenes is a smoke screen. <coughs> the Essenes is a smoke screen. She says they never existed. The whole story of the Essenes is imaginary, she said. It is clear that the library at Qumran is a priestly library it's a priestly library hmm? continuing on Elior makes a convincing case that many of the scrolls found at Qumran reflect the terminology and breath or spirit the worldview of the sons of Zadok. Priests who succeeded from temple service in the Hasmonean period. See this? They left. They took the scrolls and they got out of there. They took everything they could that belonged to them and they got out of there. Right? But some of them stayed behind and I would submit to you that one of them was Zechariah, Zechariah. He became a descendant of one of those who stayed behind. Follow me here, okay? <clears throat> so uh, they succeeded uh, from temple service uh, in the Hasmonean period because the high priesthood had been uh, uh, usurped by non-Zadokites. So who was the Pharisees? Were they non-Zadokites? Were they part Hasmonean? Were they a mixture of all this? Was there some Levites, some guys from Hasmonean lineage? This is what she's saying. This secessionist group is distinct, she points out, from those members of the Sadducee. And as we're going to see, she's talking about, look, look at the words there, spelt in English. You can hardly tell them apart now. Huh? <clears throat> Look, put see the S there in Sadducee. Put a Z. What do you see now? <laughs> put a Z where you see Sadducee, and what do you see? Zadu sees Zaduk. It's there. The connection is there. Listen to this. So from those members of the Sadducee, which she says is Zadokites, aristocracy, uh, who remained in Jerusalem and who were described by Josephus and in the New Testament. And in the Brit Hadashah. Oh, Father. 
continuing on, she says, uh, it says Eliar or Elior is not the first scholar to argue against the Qumran SNE connection. Half a century ago, Professor Moshe Gottstein of Hebrew University rejected the idea and the scholars ascribed some of the scrolls to Zadokites. A decade ago, Professor, no uh, Professor Norman Golb of the University of Chicago roiled the scholarly waters by asserting that Qumran had not housed Essenes or Essenes and that the scrolls had not been written there. They had been brought to Qumran from the libraries of Yerushalayim. <laughs> oh, Father. To be hidden in the surrounding caves as the Romans approached. The conclusion is this. In a curious episode reflecting the passions that still surround the scrolls, Gob's son, Raphael, was detained by police in New York recently on suspicion of impersonating other scholars on the Internet in an attempt to influence the uh, ASEAN debate in support of his father. Two archaeologists who excavated the Qumran for 10 years concluded that there was no SNE settlement there, contrary to the broad consensus that still prevails among the among other relevant archaeologists and scholars. He was there. He was digging in the dirt. He said, I see no sign of anybody but priests here. <laughs> There's no evidence. Why the effort to hide the identity of those running the Qumran refuge? This is a great question. Why? This truth confirms what ourselves and others have been pointing out concerning the present active priesthood. Uh, this is Teddy Wilson talking here. This is a question I asked. I'm asking. Because this truth that they're putting forth confirms what ourselves and others have been pointing out concerning the priest, present active priesthood, along with who will run the coming future temple. That's why. Do you guys feel up to it? Huh? Let's get a big hallelujah and a yamein. Now I want to work on an etymological connection. <laughs> the Sadducees and the Zadokites. Remember I was saying put the Z there. When you see Sadducee, watch this. This is a cut and paste. I found the information. <clears throat> According to Abraham Geiger, the Sadducee sect of Judaism uh, derived their their name in the Greek from a Greek. Look at this, Sadokeoi. Sadokeoi. Hebrew, Sadukim. Not Sadukim, Sadukim. From that of who? Zadok. <laughs> hey. This is a foundation shaker. I pray that John Flores ends up watching this whole thing. My brother can rejoice. Look at these connections. The first high priest of ancient Israel in the time of Solomon, and I might also add, we know he was there with uh, Dawid as well, to serve in the first temple, the leaders of the sect were proposed as the Kohenim. So we're talking about his sons operated, he operated. He, he Okay, he was already functioning when they built the temple. So that means that he's seen the Mishkan. He's seen the tabernacle in Shiloh. 
He was part of the original plan. You tell me right now what the original plan for Yahweh was when it comes to temple. It wasn't a building per se. It was a pattern and that pattern will be built. And now that we have took that pattern of the tabernacle, the Mishkan, rolled it up and put it in a temple. When the temple was built, guess what's going to come out of that temple? The Mishkan, Yahshua HaMashiach. He's the one that's going to build it. He's the one that ordained it. As y'all, as you guys see what I'm saying. And he gives us this by connecting Melech to Zadok. He shows us that it's true. He is the Melchizedek high priest. He is the one. The one and only. Blessed be the name of Yah. <clears throat> the first high priest of ancient Israel in the time of Solomon, it says, to serve in the first temple, the leaders of the sect were proposed as the Kohenim, priests, the sons of Zadok, <clears throat> descendants of Eleazar, son of Aaron. So that pulls Eleazar and Phineas into it. He keeps his promise by even just keeping the sons of Zadok in the, in the worship. You better back up. You guys better go back there and look at what they're teaching. Uh, what brother, even brother Rico is teaching us. It's wrong. They're trying to put you up underneath some people that do not have the right to bring you to the altar. You better watch out. <clears throat> the name Zadok is related to the root. There it is. Uh, Zad, Dalit, Kuf. In the modern Hebrew. And it's Sadak. See that? Sadak. To be right or just. Which could be uh, in the active of their aristocratic status in society in the initial period of their existence. In the Talmud, the story is told of the two disciples of Antigonus uh, of Sacho and Zadok of Boethus. Look at this. Watch this. Who misunderstood the true ethical value of Antiochus's teaching. The two sects of the Zadokites. What? Who was Zechariah? And who was Yohanan? He sent his son up out of there, didn't he? He was operating in there and he knew something was wrong. But he was committed. He didn't leave. He stayed there. There's two different sets of Zadokites. Do you understand? Where was one if the other was still in the temple? Could have been in Qumran, in the wilderness. Please understand. Watch this. <clears throat> the two sets of the Zadokites, which turned into Sad Zadducees and Boethusians, uh, Bo are thus, in all later rabbinic sources, always mentioned together. Now they lump them together. Why? Because they're covering up who they were. It's all about the Pharisees, isn't it? No, it wasn't. The temple worship was being led by Zadokites. And they called them Sadducees. Zadok. If you were there then, they would have called you a son of Zadok. They would not have called you a Sadducee. You would be a Sadoxy. Sadoxy. Thus, in the later rabbinic sources, sources always mentioned together, not only as being similar, but as originating at the same time. That's not true. It's getting pretty interesting, isn't it? <clears throat> Continuing on with the etymological, etymological connection of Sadducees and Zadokites. This is what I'm concluding. This is what I'm concluding with. 
Flavius Josephus mentions in the antiquities of the Yehudi that one Judas, a what? Golanite, there we go, of a city whose name was Gamala, <clears throat> who talking, who taking, <clears throat> who taking with him Saduk. Saduk. See, that's where we get Sadducee. Somebody else, maybe a Greek speaking guy. Didn't we just read that a minute ago? Or an Hellenized Jew? See the difference in the pronunciation? <clears throat> ah, somebody should forward this one to the Nehemiah. <clears throat> Taking with him Saduk, a Pharisee, became zealous to draw them to a revolt. Paul L. Meyer suggests that the sect drew near, uh, drew their name from the Saduk mentioned by Josephus. Now we're getting somewhere. This reveals the smokescreen. This is Teddy Wilson here. This reveals the smokescreen that has been placed in the history of Yahweh's people by those wanting to usurp authority over Yahweh's priestly wishes since the Exodus. It proves the original ordinance of Levitical Tarot, Levitical instruction, were violated by those who were appointed to that office. The majority of them being removed as we find in Scripture. Everybody pull out your Scriptures. Let's go to Ezekiel 44 and tell me if all this history does not line up with exactly what we've been teaching out of the book of Yehetzkel or Ezekiel. Ezekiel chapter 44. <clears throat> 9 through 15. Ezekiel 44. 9 through 15. Read along. Thus saith the master. Yahweh. Listen to your master. Somebody else is trying to set another master over you people. And with every ounce of my being, I'm not going to let it happen. Not to the people who follow this ministry. Uh-uh, hallelujah. Guard your hearts. Shamar your mind. Guard it. Keep it. Thus saith the master, Yahweh, no son of a foreigner, uncircumcised in heart or in the flesh, comes into my set-apart place, even any son of a foreigner, who is among the children of Israel, and the Levites who went far from me when Israel went astray, who strayed away from me after their idols, they shall bear their crookedness. And they were uh, attendants in my set apart place as gatekeepers of the house and attendants of the house, slaughtering the burnt offerings and the offering for the people and standing before them to attend to them because they attended to them before their idols and became a stumbling block of crookedness to the house of Israel. Therefore, I have lifted my hand in an oath against them. What? He said, I am taking an oath against those sons of Aaron. Through those Levites, I'm taking an oath against them. Caution, beware, you better watch out. If somebody's telling you that they are a son of Aaron and they try to lead you to this thing, they're trying to bring you back underneath the yoke of bondage that we were set free from when Yahshua gave that blood sacrifice as our high priest. Watch out. Yahweh's removing them clearly from office. Verse 13. And not come near me to serve me as priests, as Kohen. Uh-oh nor come near any of that which is set apart to me, nor into the most set apart place, and they shall bear their shame and their abomination, which they have done. 
said, so this Miss Elior said that this is also spoken about in the Brit Hadashah. Let's go to Hebrews chapter 7. Ibrim chapter 7. Let's look at verse 1. Hebrews chapter 7 and at verse 1. For this Malek Zadok, this righteous king, this Malkit Zedek, sovereign of Shalom, king of Shalom, priest of the Most High Elohim, who met Abraham returning from the slaughter of the sovereigns and blessed him. Hmm. So he brought Abraham. You know what it says when it, he blessed him? He got down on his knee before Abraham, and Abraham got down on his knee before Yah, and they came into covenant, and they broke bread. They sat down together. They got on the same level with one another, and they had a covenant-confirming meal. And then he, Abraham, became the priest of the Most High El. It's the same process we use every year at this ministry at least, when we break bread and drink the cup at the proper time. The majority of these other people are not having you come into the presence of the right priesthood by doing it Passover night. Verses 11 through 16. Chapter 7. <clears throat> Truly then, if perfection were through the Levitical priesthood, for under it the people were given the Torah, um, I want to ask you a question. Was the Torah of Moses given only after the Levites were given to Aaron to operate in his priesthood? Um, I'm pretty sure that the Torah existed in the days of Adam. So this is talking about a Torah, a law in the Torah, when that when the Levites came into the service of Aaron. All right. For under it the people were given the Torah. It was an instruction. Why was there still a need for another priest to arise according to the order of Melchizedek, telling you that there was a a prior priesthood and an order that had been set by law by Yahweh. That's exactly what it's telling us. And not be called according to the order of Aaron. For the priesthood being changed of necessity, there takes place a change of the what to wrote the law. Also, for he of whom this is said belongs to another tribe from which no one had attended at the altar. For it is perfectly clear that our master arose or sprang forth from Yehuda, a tribe about which Moshe never spoke concerning that priesthood. And this is clearer still. If another priest arises in the likeness of Melchizedek, who has become not according to the Torah of fleshly command, you hear that? Who has, who has become not according to the Torah of the fleshly command, but according to the power of an endless life. That's who Melchizedek was. It was the endless life, the one. It was him, the eternal he is our high priest because he sacrificed for us in the Garden of Eden. So the priesthood existed, and the laws concerning priesthood existed, and feast existed. Adam, Adam's sons was bringing offerings. There, It was all there even then. Oh, Father, hallelujah. Blessed be the name of Yah. Mm-mm-mm. Now listen to this. Here's some more stuff we dug up. 
Uh, this is in the writings of Shevet Achim. The missing page between the testaments is the name of the article. And the author writes this. The herald of David's son is John the Baptist. Oh, hold on. Oh, Father, we worship you. You are so wonderful. The herald of David's son is John the Baptist from none other than an Arianic, likely the Zadokites, priestly family. John, of course, is identified in the Gospels with the very same words with which the Dead Sea Scrolls identify the Qumran community. A voice of one crying in the wilderness, prepare the way of Yahweh. If John the Baptist is recognized in the priestly line of the Zadokites, then who was his dad but Zechariah? And he was a Zadokite operating underneath the realms of the one of the two separate groups of Zadokites. He sent his son to team up with the original Zadokites. He knew his genealogy. And he sent his son out there to be a prophet for the Most High King. And Yahweh in turn sent him into the wilderness and told him by his own words recorded in the Brit Hadashah that Elohim told him to go out and to baptize the people for repentance and remission of sin. Hallelujah. The redemption has always been given to the Zadokites. To the sons of Zadok, to the sons of light. To the children of the true light. You know that Aaron can be translated in Hebrew as light bearer or to bring to light. Yeah, he did his part. He brought us to that true light. But it's not talking about just Yahshua. It's talking about the descendants that have been ordained to bring salvation to the world. Amen. A voice crying in the wilderness, prepare the way of Yahweh. This proves that there were Sadducees. Wait, because this is me speaking, okay? This proves that there were, are, Sadducees, Zadokites, that did believe in Yahshua. What's the Pharisee going to claim? What do they want us to believe? That the Zadokites did not believe in the resurrection of the dead. They may have not until that is one of the biggest things of revel in the revelation of this teaching while I was putting it together that Yahweh showed me. Yes, they did. The Sadducees did believe in Yahshua. Just as many Sadducees as there was Pharisees believed in him. You better bet Zechariah. Zechariah, when he got the messenger of Yah that silenced his mouth for a whole nine months, he became a believer. And his son, yes, yeah, hallelujah. Yahweh's a little humor in there. This is real talk. He sent his son out there with the people who actually held the future of Israel in their hands. This proves that there were Zadokites or Sadducees that did believe in Yahshua. It also proves that history indicates there were still Zadokites operating in the first temple, albeit they were of the other realm. They got along with the Hasmoneans for a minute. Oh, okay. Somebody's mama must have come and got him. It also proves that the Zadokites were operating in the first century temple. Zechariah, Zechariah being one of them. Not only that, but they saw and then believed in the resurrection. Mic drop. Yeah, they did. 
There was just as many of them that became believers. You better bet. Yohanan, the immerser, came from those crying in the wilderness. We're preparing the way of Yah. And here he came. <laughs> now, now we're going to get into the Ezekiel and Revelation connections, connections, preparing the way for part four. Oh, Father. So what I'm saying here is this. I'm gonna, I'm gonna, I'm gonna propose this as we enter into a few things out of the book of Revelation and the book of Ezekiel that shows you it's really not two separate prophecies. It's not even two separate prophecies. It's the same one. If you put the book in order of Ezekiel, you can put the book in order of Revelation. They're both out of order. We're going to set, we're going to set them straight. Okay. Oh, Father. The connection of these two separate prophecies, I want to, I want, I want you to understand they were two separate people that prophesied there, but it was about the same prophecy. Two separate guys prophesying that occurred some 700 years apart. So somewhere around 600 BCE, five something, is when Ezekiel started prophesying. And he only prophesied for about 30, 40 years. And then until 95, between 95 and 100 of the common era is when Yohanan wrote the book of Revelation. So we have approximately 700 years, just under a millennium, they 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 wrote their writings that far apart from one another. So those writings occurred some 700 years apart, and they are some of the most important connections the body of Yahshua could ever make. It connects both the first and second resurrections of the dead, clarifies the Messiah's thousand-year reign on earth, and connects all of the prophecy in Ezekiel concerning end times to Hasadot Ha Yahshua Hamashiach. <laughs> Are you hearing me? It connects Hasadot. In the middle of that Hebrew word Sadot, what do you see? Sowed. It's a it's a mystery. It's a secret. And that's what the original book was named. Of Revelation. Hasadot. The soul level. The secret that Paul talked about. I reveal unto you a mystery. I'm giving you the soul level. Of these things. Listen to this. If you're not getting the soul level. Where you're at ever. Get out. Connect yourself to truth seekers. And truth speakers. He's bringing revelation unhinged off the hook we're going off the rails with the off the charter i feel so humbled this stuff is real we are living out the prophecies of ezekiel and yohanan right now Somebody bless his name now. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Bless his name. Hallelujah. This is the reason why we do this, people. Hasadot Yahshua Hamashiach that was given to Yohanan by the messenger and Yahshua himself. So Ezekiel and Revelation connections, watch this. I want to share some of the connections that cannot be seen unless one is able to first place the Ezekiel writings in the proper order as we have pointed out throughout this series. Now, so what I'm saying is the first seven, if you look at the dates and the times of the first seven chapters, they should be at the end of the book. 
in chapter eight, it tells you the earliest dates that he was writing about. So chapter eight is where he begins his writing. And the Masorites moved the end of the book to the beginning. And you can tell by the dates and times that they did, somebody moved it. And what that does is takes all of the power, all of the strength and all of the authority to the end time events out of the hands of the Pharisees. It takes it completely out of the hands of the Pharisees unless they repent and turn to Yahshua. <laughs> huh? Just like the rest of us. So both of these writings start off by Yahweh. This is where I want to bring it in. Now watch this. I'm going to explain this to you. Please listen. Both of these writings start off by Yahweh revealing to the prophet the things going on in his house that is not pleasing to himself as a warning for corporate repentance. Let's go to Ezekiel chapter 8, which is actually Ezekiel chapter 1. Head school chapter eight. Now look. <laughs> Let's begin at verse one. And it came to be in the sixth year, in the sixth month, on the fifth of the month, as I sat in my house with the elders of Yehuda sitting before me, that the hand of the master Yahweh fell upon me there. And I looked and saw a now look at the description. Look at the description here. Okay. The hand of the master Yahweh fell upon me there. And I looked and saw a likeness like the appearance of fire. And from his waist and downward, the appearance was like fire. And from his waist and upward, the appearance of brightness like glowing metal. He's, and he stretched out the form of a hand and took me by the lock of my hair. And the Ruach lifted me up between the uh, earth and the heavens, but between the Eretz and the Shemayim, and brought me in vision of Elohim to where? Yerushalayim. He brought him in a vision to Yerushalayim. Didn't he prophesy in the dispersion? <laughs> First, he goes over why it all happened. And then he goes into later on what's going to happen. Okay. To the door of the north gate of the inner courtyard where the seat of the image of jealousy was, which causes jealousy. And see, the esteem of the Elohim of Israel was there, like the vision that I saw in the plain. And he said to me, son of man, please lift your eyes toward the north. And I lifted my eyes northward and the north of the altar gate. I saw this image of jealousy in the entrance. And he said to me, son of man, do you see what they are doing? The great abominations, which the house of Israel are doing there, driving me away from my set apart place. And you are to still see greater abominations. Verse 13, and he said to me, you are to still to see greater abominations, which they are doing. He brought me to the door, to the north gate of the house of Yahweh. And I, so you see he's addressing the house and he's revealing through the prophet the things that they're doing in the house that he does not want done. It's going to cause the house to be destroyed. And he's calling for corporate repent, repentance while they're already in the dispersion. Through Ezekiel. He's telling Ezekiel to tell them this is the reason why it's happening. Let's get it all on record. And then he goes on to tell them about this future temple 
in which it will never be destroyed again and that the majority of them will never have right to the altar service ever again. Are you following me? He's telling them what's going on in his house that he does not approve of. Let's go to Revelation chapter 1. <clears throat> of course, it's Hasidot here. So level, the secret, the revelation of the secrets, name of the proper name of the book. Let's pick up at verse 10. <laughs> Do you see what I see before I even say anything? Yeah. All right. I came to be in the Ruach on the day of Yahweh. And I heard behind me a loud voice as of a trumpet saying, I am the first and the last. And write in a book what you see and, and send it to the seven assembly, my house. Send it to my house. Send it to the assemblies of my house. In Asia, in Galatia, in all these places, these seven assemblies, hallelujah. <laughs> I'm just saying, speak to us, Father. <laughs> Give us a slow rumble, break it to us easy. Write it in a book, what you see, and send it to the seven assemblies of Asia, to Ephesus, Smyrna, Pergamos, Thyatria, Sardis, Philadelphia, and Laodicea. And I turned to see the voice which spoke with me, and having turned, I saw seven golden lampstands. Remember the description we just got. We're going to make a connection starting off in part four directly to that so that we can pull all this stuff in order. But look at what he sees. And having turned in verse 12, I saw seven golden lampstands. Verse 13. And in the midst of the seven lampstands, one like the son of Adam. Dressed in a robe down to the feet and girded about the chest with a golden band. And his head and hair were white as white wool, as snow, and his eyes as what a flame of fire. Do we have to go back and read the description that we just got out of Ezekiel? Verse 15. And his feet like burnished brass, as if refined in a furnace, and his voice as the sound of many waters. And in his right hand, he held seven stars, and out of his mouth went a sharp two-edged sword, and his face was as the sun shining in its strength. And when I saw him, I fell at his feet as dead, and he placed me, and he placed his right hand on me saying, do not be afraid. I am the first and I am the last and the living one. I became dead and see, I am living forever and ever. Amen. I and I possess the keys of the grave and of death. Write therefore what you have seen, both what it is now and what shall take place after these. This is where the rest of the prophecies start coming in. It's the same prophecy but he's showing you the prophecy with Yahshua in it. Verse 20. The Sadot. The Sowed. 
the secret, the mystery. The sowed of the seven stars, which you saw in my right hand, and the seven golden lampstands, the seven stars are the messengers of the seven assemblies, and the seven lampstands, which you saw, are seven assemblies. We have the same type of description that Ezekiel gave in his prophecy of Yahweh. And here we have the same type of description. And Yahweh said, yeah, I'm actually the one. Yeah, I, I, I was alive and then and then I was dead and then I was I lived again. I'm alive. There's life only in him. Okay, now let's look at uh, chapter two. Verses three through five. He's given corporate warning. Watch this. We're going to go through this. He's given corporate warning to his house through a messenger, through a prophet. It's the same prophecy, everybody. Watch this. Chapter two, verses three through five. And you have been bearing up and have endurance and have labored, labored for my name's sake, and have not become weary. But I hold this against you, that you have left your first love. So remember from where you have fallen. What? Remember from where you have fallen, and repent, and do the first works, or else I shall come to you speedily and remove your lampstand from its place unless you repent. He's given corporate warning. How do we know that? Because the next ones, they really didn't do anything wrong, but they're getting the same warning. Verse 10. He tells Smyrna, do not be afraid of what you are about to suffer. <clears throat> but what did we do wrong? Nothing. Doesn't matter. It's a corporate judgment. Huh? Huh? Do not be afraid of what you are about to suffer. See, the devil is about to throw some of you in prison in order to try you, and you shall have pressure 10 days. Be trustworthy until the death, and I shall give you the crown of life. This is a corporate warning of repentance in all assemblies, in all people. It's the same exact prophecy. Verses 14 through 16. Behold, I have a few matters against you because you have there are those who adhere to the teaching of Balaam, Balaam, who taught Balak to put a stumbling block before the children of Israel and to eat food offered to idols and to commit whoring. So also you have those who adhere to the teaching of the Nicolites, which teaching I hate. Repent, or else I shall come to you speedily and fight against them with the sword of my mouth. So should we just be fellowshipping with any old buddy? It's corporate judgment. It's the same warnings by the same one. The description, hey, if the shoe fits, you got to put it on. Huh? Look at this. Let's look at chapter 3, verses 1 and 2. This is written to Sardis. He says, He who has the seven spirits, these are messengers of Elohim. He already told us that, remember? Uh, so, to the messenger of the assembly of Sardis, write, He who has the seven messengers of Elohim and the seven stars says this, I know your works that you have a Name that you are alive, but you are dead. Wake up and strengthen what remains and is about to die, for I have not found your works complete before Elohim. It's the same corporate warning to the same remnant of people. The remnant was told by the apostle Shaul, don't be haughty. If he, if he got rid of them, he'll get rid of you too. Here's the same exact teaching right here. You, 
Yahweh's command through his prophet for his house to repent. It's the same exact topic. If you set it in order. Hallelujah. Ezekiel and Revelation connections. Look at this. Let's look at a few more very important connections of this connected prophecy. Look at this. Here's one topic. The seal on the foreheads of the Kodashim. <clears throat> what? Hey, part four, get ready. <laughs> oh, Heavenly Father, Yah, we worship you. Thank you so very much. Help us to connect those dots and find that popcorn trail back to your Malkuya. Revelation chapter 7, verses 1 through 3. And after this, I saw four messengers standing at the four corners of the earth, holding the four winds of the earth, that the wind should not blow on the earth, nor on the sea, nor on any tree. And I saw another messenger coming up from the rising of the sun, holding the seal of the living Elohim. And he cried with a loud voice to the four messengers to whom it was given to harm the earth and the sea, saying, Do not harm the earth, nor the sea, nor the trees, until we have sealed the servants of our Elohim upon their foreheads. That's where this comes in. Then we know that the name was on the foreheads of the Kodashim. That comes later. We'll set that in order in the next, in part four. But where is this coming from? Let's go to Ezekiel chapter nine. <laughs> Ezekiel nine. Nine, one through four. And he called out in my hearing with a loud voice saying, let the punishers of the city draw near, each with his weapon of destruction in his hand. What is the context from where we just got this same topic from? Please understand it's the same prophecy. Let the punishment of the city draw near, each with his weapon of destruction in his hand. <laughs> Come on. And look, six men came from the direction of the upper gate with faces, uh, which faces north and with his battle axe in his hand. And one man in their midst was clothed with a linen and had an, uh, a writer's inkhorn at his side. And they came in and stood beside the bronze altar. And the esteem of the Elohim of Israel went up from the cherub. Remember? He said, I've got all these guys that are standing ready to execute my judgment. I'm giving you warning, right? And he told and he told him, hey, everything that I show you, I want you to write down in a book. Starting over in verse three, and the esteem of the Elohim of Israel went up from the cherub where it has been, where it had been to the threshold of the house. And he called to the man clothed with the linen, who had the uh, writer's inkhorn at his side. And Yahweh said to him, pass on into the midst of the city, into the midst of Jerusalem, and you shall put a mark on the foreheads of the men who sigh and cry over the abominations that are done within it. Huh? Back to Revelation. Chapter 10. Topic here, not going to delay anymore. I'm not going to delay. 
It's coming. Revelation chapter 10, verses 1 through 7. This is just a prelude to the, I mean, it's, it's just verse after verse after verse. It's the same prophecy, everyone. All, and as we're going to see, it confirms the thousand-year millennial reign on the earth. Again, Revelation 10, 1 through 7. And I saw another strong messenger coming down from the Shemayim, robed in a cloud and in a rainbow on his head, and a rainbow on his head. And his face was like the sun, and his feet like columns of fire. And having in his hand a little book opened, and he placed his right foot on the sea and his left foot on the land. And he cried out with a voice, with a loud voice, as when a lion roars, and he cried out, seven thunders spoke their sounds. And when the seven thunders spoke their sounds, I was about to write, but I heard the voice of, from the Shemayim saying to me, seal up what the seven thunders spoke and do not write them. And the messenger whom I saw standing on the sea and on the land lifted up his right hand to the Shemayim and swore by him who lives forever and ever, who created the Shemayim and what is in it, and the Eretz and what is in it, and the sea and what is in it, that there shall be no further delay. But in the days of the sounding of the seventh messenger, when he is about to sound the what sowed? Yep. The secret of Elohim shall also be ended as he declared to his servants, the prophets. The what? Servants, the who? Prophets. Ezekiel is right there. Do you think that we could probably be taken... You're taking part of this right now? Show me where else the revelation is coming from. I don't know. I really don't. Ezekiel chapter 12. Verses 21 through 25. Yehetzkel, chapter 12, verses 21 through 25. And the word of Yahweh came to me saying, Son of man, what is this proverb that you people have about the land of Israel, which says the days go by and every vision shall come to naught? Therefore, therefore say to them, Thus said the master Yahweh, I shall make this proverb to cease so that they no longer use it as a proverb in Israel. But say to them, the days draw near or have drawn near as well as the matter of every vision. For no longer is there to be any false vision or flattering divination within the house of Israel. For I am Yahweh, I speak, and the word which I speak is done. It is no longer deferred. Not delaying it anymore. Huh? For in your days, O rebellious house, when I speak the word, I shall do it, declares the master Yahweh. Look at this. Everybody take a look at that. We are proving the words of the messengers. The the sod, the sodot, the, the, the mysteries are being revealed through those who are being obedient to the word of Almighty Yah in the body of Yahshua, just like the prophecy said. It's being unsealed and being made known to a certain elect group of people. 
it proves that the messengers of Yah all prophesied for the same exact reason. The end purpose is that so that the mysteries that have been hidden by Daniel seal this up that is being made known. We're living in a time period, we just read it, where these things are going to be made known to certain people within the body of Yahshua. It's the secret or hidden things of Yahweh. What are we going to do with it? Uh, right, exactly. And what, what else are we going to do with it? We're going to do a part four. We're going we're gonna to lay it all out on the table in this next PowerPoint. Everybody? This is of the utmost importance. Do we understand the allegations of what we just read? Uh, there it is. It is. Does anybody feel the end times closing in on us? We've made our move just in the nick of time. We're rooted and grounded where y'all wants us to be. At least doctrinally. But what are we going to do with it? Exactly. Whether the world believes it or not. Remember that old show back in the 80s, 70s, or 80s? Ripley's Believe It or Not. Yeah, here we are, rippling. It's rippling throughout the world. It's shaking foundations. I don't care what people say. I don't care what people think. This stuff, wait till we bring some Hebrew with this next PowerPoint. We worship you. Melik Zadik. We don't care what people think or say. We're going to bring it whether you like it or not. What happened to the majority of the people that didn't want to hear that he was truly a prophet of Yah? What happened to the people that truly did not want to listen to the voice crying in the wilderness? They're dead, dead, dead. With no hope of the first resurrection of the dead, dead, dead. There's our contact information. If you have any questions or comments concerning anything that we... <clears throat> went over this evening if you have any good or bad comments whatever they may be that's where you can get a hold of us um let me see if i can't go over to the youtube real quick and look at the comments there in the chat section Scott Robbins, give me a call, brother. I, I've been trying to reach out to you. Uh, I don't know if I have the right phone number. <clears throat> Teshuva Tales, Shalom family. Yep, we've been looking forward to this one as well. I pray that it has touched you. Shalom to you all out there in Canada. Oh, and there's Brother John James. Brother Flores, hallelujah, brother. I'm going to send you this PowerPoint. We love you, and we pray that you and your family are all doing well. <laughs> yeah.
Yeah. John Flores, I love you, brother. And I do pray that your daughter's house is um, making leaps and bounds towards the kingdom. Hallelujah. Your whole house, your grandchildren, your seed in general. May Yahweh bring the barakot of his kingdom, his malku, upon you and your home. Yes, it, it, prepare our hearts for the things to come. Yes, yes, it, that's the thing. We have uh, things that are, are hard to break away from. They're hard to turn away from. Um, but we must be willing to lay things aside. Hallelujah. Uh, our prayers go out to uh, whoever whoever it is that we are, are arranging a funeral for. Uh, may Yahweh bless that. Yeah. <clears throat> for some reason, I can't always see all of the comments. I don't know. It's been an ongoing problem. I'll look over here and see if I can see. Yeah. Uh, thank you uh, to Shuva Tells. Uh, you're very correct. The threshold covenant, no one not bringing this doctrine shall enter. This is this has been told to us over and over and over. So, yeah, I can't even see. Here's one. All right. So that was part three. Um, I don't know exactly when we'll get part four put together. But believe me, it's coming soon. And, and so is he. So let's go ahead and pray out. Again, if you have any uh, questions or comments, get a hold of us there at that email address at the bottom of your screen. And may Yahweh bless and keep each and every one of you as we pray out this evening. Father, we are so thankful for your word and for this uh, sedot, these, these mysteries, these these revelations that you're bringing towards us, that you're revealing to us. Father, help us to use this wisdom that you're giving us in a way that you wish for us to use it. Help us to prepare one another. Help us to expose what is wicked in the wrong path to walk so that we can walk that straight and narrow path that leads to you and the Malkuya. And we just ask forgiveness of all of our sin once again in the mighty name of your redemption, Yahshua, and according to the blood that he shed, Father, forgive us. Be with us. We give you praise, honor, glory, and blessings for they belong to you. We pray all of this in the mighty name of your redemption, Yahshua HaMashiach. Hallelujah. So, everyone, until next time, may Yahweh bless and keep each and every one of you. If you're looking for all of the uh, future temple te teachings, you can go to our YouTube page, Seekers of Yahweh, on YouTube, and you'll see the playlist about halfway down your screen as you're scrolling down. So until next time, may Yahweh bless and keep each and every one of you, and shalom, shalom.